Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 85, the Brett Hedekin Hockey Journey. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we start strumming our sixth string, belt out a couple songs, and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota, or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to sweethockeycoach.com, that's sweethockeycoach.com, and watch the video on the home page for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Once I found out my next guest agreed to come on the Hockey Journey podcast, I'm not going to lie, The excitement bell started going ding, 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 ding. Brett Hedekin is a Minnesota native who made the most out of his hockey opportunities throughout his life. It wasn't until he reached his senior year of high school, experienced a seven-inch growth spurt, did his hockey opportunities begin. It started with a D1 scholarship to St. Cloud State University, a roster spot on the 1992 USA Olympic hockey team, a Stanley Cup ring with the Carolina Hurricanes, retired having played 1,039 NHL games, and currently is in the broadcasting game working with the San Jose Sharks. I had the privilege to play with Mr. Hedekin on two different occasions throughout my career, but haven't seen the guy since I retired in 2001, so like I said, I'm pretty excited to reconnect with this amazing human being. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Brett Hedekin to the show. Hedy, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Uh, Pitt, it's, uh, it's first of all great to reconnect with you. Uh, you're right, it's been a long time, too long since you and I have connected, but uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I was telling you before we hit record that this is the first <clears throat> podcast episode that I had to put long johns on and my toque. I usually wear a baseball. <laughs> it's like 12 below here, so you just finished up Hockey Day uh, in Minnesota here on Saturday, and you're still thawing out, huh? I, I tell you what, I had to come home last night and take a hot shower just to try to get that my internal body warmed back up again. I'm, I, hey, we're living in California, Pitt, now. I don't have that uh, thick blood like you Minnesotans do that be able to can handle that. And I didn't have the right gear. I didn't have any long johns on. I didn't have any big, nice boots that could really keep my feet warm. But I, uh, I froze, but it was definitely worth it to get back and uh, – just feel the Minnesota way, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Pitt. It's just the Minnesota people, um, hockey day, Minnesota and white bear. They really did a terrific job. I mean, these things aren't easy to put on and for, to give these kids and these athletes, the experience to have a, a really big deal outside ice, bringing back that heritage of what you and I grew up doing a lot, I'm sure is, is skating outside. And I think that's something that I, really cherished over these last two days. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it definitely does bring back a lot of memories. And the house that I have lived in here since my kids were little is right next to a pond that Mm. I had my own Lance Boney, ran my hose down there, you know, maintained that rink for a while. So I know you're pressed for time and we could talk for weeks, I know. But before we get into what you're doing today in the broadcasting world with the San Jose Sharks, uh, I'd like you to put on your fog hat, turn the knob to slow ride, and let's take a moment and look in the rear view mirror and go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports? Basically, tell the listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up Brett Hedekin. <laughs> well, Pitt, I mean, you know, growing up uh, a block away from an outdoor rink in North St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, had terrific youth programs in, in North St. Paul, not really knowing where hockey would take me, but I, I was always really 
Love the experiences that I had, the tournaments I played in with some of the traveling teams I played on. And, you know, you get on this journey. And I think when I was 10 years old, Pitt, I remember watching the 1980 Olympic team win the gold medal. And I think you and me, probably that generation of American hockey players, I think that was a huge day. Clearly, it was yeah. a huge day in, in, in America, but it was a huge day for hockey players across America. And I think a lot of us probably said, man, I want to do that. I want to become an Olympian and represent our I country. Did. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was cool, but I didn't say I wanted to be one of them. Did you? I did. I mean, at that, I remember sitting there with my dad, Pitt. Um, we were lit, sitting on the carpet against the couch watching the 1980 Olympic team win that gold. And I just, it was like a switch went off in my head. It was like, that's what I want to do. I want to become an Olympian. I think even at 10 years old, you kind of throw it out there in the universe. And I think that's something that was driving me through my youth years and through my teenage years as I got closer to high school. I started to know that, hey, the only way I'm going to do this, I kind of broke it into chunks and saying, figuring, okay, I, I've got to get a, I got to go to college. That's the only way I'm going to be able to accomplish this dream. And so I went to college at St. Cloud State. And it's funny because Really, I didn't play much in high school up until my senior year. I played very little. So I want, I hope some kids that are listening and parents to know that, you know, if you're not playing as a freshman or sophomore or junior and your kid's still driven and still working and to try to create an opportunity for himself and he's focused, you're still going to have an opportunity to, uh, to make it. And I think that was the biggest thing for me to, to keep at it. And I grew seven inches my junior year going into my senior year. Okay, hold on. So yeah. leading up to your senior year, and you just set a seven-inch growth spurt, that's kind of a substantial. Uh, you're telling me that you didn't play varsity full-time. You were like on swing line and or just played JV. Um, up until my senior year, pretty much. I was didn't play that much. And really, I think the coach, just like in college, and I'll get there in a little bit, but he uh, – he tried to put me at forward a little bit, and I was always a defenseman. And people just tried to, because I could skate, they thought maybe I was a forward, and I was never a forward. I just, I always felt real comfortable on defense. But, yeah, that growth spurt pit really helped me, you know, obviously it hit the radar. People didn't know who I was. And then all of a sudden, hey, who's this kid that's six foot two that can skate? And, uh, you know, I had some people knocking on my door, but really only one school really officially knocked on my door, which was St. Cloud State. And that's where you ended up going. And you, uh, uh, before we get to, to, you know, that year, so that had been pretty special year ago, you know, your senior year, because all of a sudden, like you said, no one knows who you are. And now you are the, like, where did this guy come from? And everyone's trying to grab you. Uh, it had to have been pretty, uh, cool, a little feather in the cap for all the hard work and the knock knockdowns, uh, throughout your youth career. But I'm sure it took its toll because all of a sudden you're getting your your ego pumped a little bit. And I'm sure your parents uh, kind of reined you in and told you that you're just at the beginning of this process. Yeah, I think the one thing my parents always, you know, gave me is that humility. I think, as you, as you say there, Pitt, I think I always witnessed them working hard. They both came from uh, my mom came from a big family of 12. She was one of 12 siblings. <laughs> And uh, my dad had, uh, you know, two older brothers and a, and, a, and a younger brother. So he came from a semi-large family. And I think, you know, those seeing my parents both work, work a couple of jobs my whole youth, you know, I, I, I realized that, hey, nothing in life is going to come easy. And yeah. I think that's what really gave me that work ethic to know that, hey, this isn't, you know, this is an everyday thing. This is a get up and and grind and and train and get and get focused on where you want to go and i think that's what really helped me I, I, and i really think that you know with st cloud the, the one school that knocked on my door i had some division three schools um you know they didn't they they think they gave eight guys full rides and they had one full ride left that they split between me and one other guy um and we we i took it you know i took the partial scholarship um i knew it could have been you know and just an opportunity. That's all I knew as I had that one goal at 10 years old thinking Olympic team someday, who knows, but I know if I ever get to that stage, I got to go to college. Yeah. I got to, I got to find a way. And so off to St. Cloud, I went and 
again, another coach, you know, they recruited three Canadian defensemen pit. And as me, a defenseman coming from Minnesota, they clearly didn't think I was good enough to play at defense. So they moved me to forward my freshman year. Didn't have, again, a clue on what I was doing as a freshman. Okay. I, was, I was in and out of the lineup. And you're going to really like this one. The nights I was out of the lineup, I was in the corner of the arena. And every time there was a stoppage of play, I would hit the play button on the cassette player to play music throughout the arena. So, <laughs> what the, the other healthy scratch had to be the mascot for the day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was that guy and he was that guy. And, and, you know, we were those guys that, uh, that would do the, the, the music between the stoppages of play. Um, oh, that's brilliant. But, you know, the one thing I do will say about this that kids can learn from Pitt is, I still, even though I was in and out of the lineup, I kept believing in what I could do. And I walked into the coach's office at the end of the year and I said, look, I'm, I appreciate this opportunity that you gave me this year as a freshman at forward, but you know, I'm a defenseman. I mean, that's, that's where my gene, I have the defenseman gene. I think it's you and I are both D men and you either got yeah. the D gene or the forward gene. I got the D gene. Yeah, me too. And, and I just felt more confident, more comfortable back there. And I asked him, I said, look, I really want to come back next year. I want you to believe in me. I know I believe in myself. I believe I can help this team on defense. And uh, he just said, okay, I want you to go back in the summer, start playing defense in the summer leagues, and then we'll see you back here your sophomore year, and we'll see what we can do. And, uh, you know, I think Coach Greg Dahl, I think, over many years came to me and said, you know, Brett, I thought I was really going to cut you. I was going to cut you after your freshman year and, you know, that sophomore tryout, but I came back and I was ready and, you know, had, uh, I think 17 points in the first 20 games of the season. And, and, and I got a little bit of an injury that, towards the end of that sophomore year, but uh, I really regrouped that. I finally put myself on the table to say, Hey, I can actually play this game at defense. And uh, that's when it all started to kind of just started to shift for me. I think my body growing seven inches as a high school kid, you know, having to keep, believing in myself, have to keep going back to the drawing table, trying to prove to my teammates and my coach that, hey, I can still do this. And it all kind of culminated into my junior year of college. And that's kind of when everything sort of came together for me. And uh, uh, that was the season I really, puck was going the back of the net. Um, it was just one of those magical years for me that, I, I, you know, you just can't believe one of those seasons that you have, you know. You just get on that wave and you just ride that thing. So what was the next opportunity that came from that, you know, pretty consistent performing? Well, I'm uh, on spring break down in Florida after our junior year with all my teammates. And we're just having a, a, a couple days break and the phone rings back at the condo. And that's something that you never want to get, right? That phone call when you're on uh, <laughs> spring break from your parents. Um, <laughs> No, but but the call came in and uh, they said, "Hey, Hedy, your your mom and dad are on the phone inside uh, the condo." So I went inside there. We didn't have cell phones, you know, as b back then. But took the call. My mom's in one room, my dad's in the other, and they both were excited. And they said, "Brett, you're not going to believe this, but we just got a call from the U.S. national team to have you go if you want, fly to Boston and fly to Russia to represent the United States in this tournament called the Pravda Cup." And this was the only opportunity that I had ever had, ever had the call, the privilege to play for the national team. I, I never, not once as a kid growing up to this moment, a junior in college, did I ever get this opportunity. And, you know, my parents were crying and I was, I was you know, emotional as well because I, I think we all knew that this was that moment, Pitt, that you get, yeah. that you know that it's an opportunity that you have to run through the door. And so yeah. I flew home, got my equipment, met the team in Boston, flew to Russia and uh, I played four of the best games of my life and just completely left it all out there as much as I could. And that was the beginning of this journey that really started for me that led me to eventually the NHL. But I'll, I'll never forget that after that tournament, they asked me to try out for the national team and, and I was going to have to make a decision on leaving school to, to, if I did make the team and, you know, you don't really focus on that. You just focus on trying to improve every day and that humility that we talked about earlier. I think that's the thing that allowed me to go back that summer, get ready for that tryout, and uh, eventually made that national team. We both did. 
I you know, probably don't remember, but I was on that team too. <laughs> I, I, I know we we played together there, and we actually ended up playing together again, as you referenced earlier in Florida. But you know what? Were, you know that's another thing that for you, we were, we were like kind of the, only a couple of the Minnesotan guys on that team. Like there's only a very few few of us. A lot of them were from the out east in, in the Boston and Massachusetts area, which was uh, uh, an interesting kind of dynamic within that group. But, you know, a lot of fun playing with you, a lot of fun playing with Bischoff and Hankinson and some of the other Minnesota guys that we had. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, my mine ended, you know, with a broken leg right before uh, the team left and stuff. I, I doubt I would have been on that team, but I would have been getting the other ticket going, <laughs> not to France, but to New York to go home. Uh, but what do you remember by, I just remember that just being a real difficult tour. Mm. Uh, it just, they were bringing guys in and out all the time. It was so uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, what do you remember? God, I'm glad that you said that because I think I felt the same thing. Um, I think it was the first time in my career that you, you kind of, you start to realize that you got to kind of go inside here and you can't focus on a lot of other things that are going on around you you have to start to begin to think about the things that you do well and not try to be somebody that you're not you just you know that's off the ice that's on the ice when you step over those boards really trying to figure out okay what what do I do well and how can I do that every night and I think that environment as you mentioned kind of guys coming in and out of that that ecosystem was kind of a it was tough, man. I, it felt cutthroat to me. Did it for you too? Oh, oh, yeah. It was, it was tough. Let's put it this way: when, when I broke my leg, yeah. and it, you know, it was like the weight of the world was just taken off my shoulders. You're like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm tapping out. I can't do anything about it. Yeah, it, it was tough. So I, I, you know, I'm glad that you were able to uh, have that experience, and I know that uh, once you get there and go through it then and it's over and you look back and you're like that was pretty doggone cool to be a part of that uh there's not much time <laughs> to really sit there and pat yourself on the back you had an nhl career to to get after and again i know that you're pressed for time uh oh. kind of just let's walk through the uh you know the getting drafted part uh how you ended up getting into st louis and then the three that I want to focus on is every NHL, well, any player uh, male that's trying to make it as high as you can. It's the Olympics and then probably trying to play in the NHL. And then after that, it's trying to win a Stanley Cup. Uh, I only got to the second round as a uh, as a player uh, broadcaster. I got to the third round and you got to the finals three times. So let's start where you got getting drafted your St. Louis time, and then let's get to the Stanley Cup uh, Vancouver run. Yeah, absolutely. And, and first of all, I got time. Bit. Let's just uh, lay it out there, man. Okay. I just really, I really appreciate, you know, just you even having me on. I think it's fun to talk to your listeners. And, um, you know, if we can teach anybody out there listening on the journeys that you and I and guys like me have had, I think it's, it's really great for people to kind of capture that. You know, I got drafted – from the St. Louis Blues, and in the 10th round, I was 198th pick, and that was going what, back. What? To Hold on. Time out. You got yeah. drafted in the 10th round? Yeah. I, I didn't think that. I got drafted in the 9th round. I didn't think anyone got drafted in the 10th round. There Was was there a 10th round? All right. Hey. Eddie, thank you. Hey, I was one of the last guys. I was almost Mr. Irrelevant, you know, that last <laughs> in the draft. Um but it's kind of funny because after that senior year high school, you know, that kind of, you know, things came together for me. I remember the draft happened, never got a call. And my dad wakes me up at, I don't know, nine o'clock in the morning. You know how we sleep in as, you know, young teenagers. Yeah. And he says, Brett, wake up. Cause he'd read the paper every day. He says, look right here. You were drafted yesterday in the 10th round by the St. Louis blues. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I didn't get, like I said, I didn't get the call. Um, but that's the day I, I found out I was drafted. My dad waking me up at 9 a.m. But after, after the Olympic Games, um, I went back to school and at St. Cloud State. Didn't get the call. I think about 90% of the guys off that 92 team all went to, uh, went to turn pro, signed contracts, and, and went. For some reason, I didn't get that call. St. Louis, uh, 
you know, didn't offer me a contract right away. So I thought, you know, maybe I'm going back to St. Cloud for the year for my senior year. Um, and my agent that I had, or, you know, not an agent's per se, you can't say that right back in the day as more of a, your team and your family advisor um, said, you know what, you might get the call on that Monday morning, the first day of classes that we're going to start. And so I, I stayed home from school thinking, okay, I can get through this one day, you know, miss my first day of school just to kind of wait by the phone and see if I could get that call. Uh, skipped it Monday. He said, you know what, it's going to come Tuesday. I think you better stay again. So I skipped Tuesday, didn't get the call. I go back to school on that Wednesday morning and uh, I come back thinking I'm going back to school. You know, this is it. I'm not going to turn pro like the rest of these guys did. And that's okay. I thought I was going to have a, you know, a fun senior year coming up. And sure enough, I got a pizza in the oven and uh, the phone rings and it's uh, my agent. He says, we just got the call from the blues and uh, I think the contract looks pretty good. I think you should sign it. And uh, that was it. Signed that contract, got my gear. And I was literally in Montreal joining the St. Louis Blues about two days later, skating on the old Montreal Forum ice, you know, for my first skate ever in the National Hockey League. And a few nights after that, they didn't put me in the game that night, but two nights later, I played my first game in Toronto in the old Maple Leaf Gardens. And uh, wow. yeah, I can never just never, you know how you can never forget those first few days on the NHL, your first game. You know, the locker room, you can just see yourself walking out on the ice and, you know, almost skating above the ice. You're just so amped up. And yeah. uh, that was the beginning of, I think, a, a, another part of the career. Like we talk about USA hockey and that environment that was kind of tough. I think this environment in St. Louis was tough as well. I think there wasn't really a, a coach that could mentor me, uh, a defenseman coach. And I think I struggled for the first few years, got injured, injured my knee. Um, tore my MCL and that was set me back and for, for a long time. And at one point I remember when I fi finally started getting back healthy after a couple of years there, I remember going up to Vancouver pit to play the Canucks and this Vancouver Canuck team, I was blown away at how tough they were to play against every every guy on the ice just seemed to get tougher and tougher to play against. Yeah. And I just remember after that game, sitting back in my stall going, man, this is a hockey team, man, that I just played here tonight. And I, for whatever reason, I kind of, you know, one of those moments that, again, you throw it out in the universe. We played that Vancouver Canucks a few months later, and I circled that game on my calendar saying, I'm going to be ready for this game. I'm going to try to impress this team because, you know, I think I was such in a tough place in St. Louis where it just wasn't working for me, the environment in the locker room or for whatever reason, even though I loved the town, I loved the, you know, the team per se. It's just, it wasn't a right fit yet. And uh, so when I played that game against the Vancouver Canucks, um, I tried to leave a mark. I tried to at least impress somebody. And sure enough, they make a trade after my, you know, three and a half years in St. Louis. They pull me in the office. They say, hey, Brett, we're, uh, we just made a trade. And we want to wish you the best of luck. And I said, well, where, where did I get traded to? And he said, the Vancouver Canucks. And uh, that was the moment. You know, I shook their hand and I got in that plane and I went to Vancouver and was I right about that team? Yeah, that team was unbelievable. Went all the way to the Stanley Cup finals that year. We played against the New York Rangers in game seven. Um, we lost that game, but I'll tell you what, there were so many moments throughout that run leading up to the Stanley Cup finals. Uh, the first game as a Vancouver Canuck, one of them, I made a mistake in the first game and I remember you know, five guys coming over to me, tapping me on the shin pad saying, Hey, don't worry. We got your back. We'll, we'll get that back for you. And I just remember this kind of, like you say, that weight falling off your back thinking, Holy cow. I, this is what a team feels like. This is what guys that when they support one another, what can happen. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of, you know, my first really good Stanley cup run that I learned so much, you know, off the ice, on the ice and, and just what a team looks like from the inside. So, um, you know, that had, to, that had to sting a little bit, that losing that game seven. Um, how, uh, you know, up until that point, you, you, you had some adversity, you said, with some, um, some injuries and that it maybe wasn't the right fit uh, down in St. Louis. But you get to Vancouver and it is the right fit. And then you have that thing happen at the end. Huh? How does it change up here for you? And who helped you with that? 
or do you just have to go through it? No, I, I think <clears throat> there's one thing that happened in that run pit. I went through ebb flows during the playoff um, round. So round one, I really thought I played well. I kind of, I always say I went in that first series against Calgary and I went in a boy and I came out a man on the other side of it. And I was just 23, 24 years old. And going through a really tough playoff round, you know how it changes you, right? You you yeah. you play at another level that you ne- never thought you could get to, and it's another level of just mean. You know, you gotta you gotta garner that meanness inside you that sometimes you don't know you even have. Yeah. And I go into the round two, and uh, I played again another really solid round against the Dallas Stars. We swept them. We, we all played terrific in that series. But the third series, <clears throat> we played against Toronto, and that was the conference final. And I remember getting a little bit tight. Um, I felt the pressure. I'd never been in a situation before. Mm-hmm. And, and that kind of always, after this round, these rounds and this playoff, I always went back to that thinking, okay, why did that happen? Why did I get tight? What, what was I feeling? Um, you know, you got to kind of, that's one of the things maybe people can grab from this too today is that you ask yourself these questions, you know, be honest with yourself. It's okay to self-assess afterwards and think, okay, you know, what made me get nervous? What made me get tight? What made me play poor? You know? Um, but I got through that round and I I probably think that maybe the coach might've thought about pulling me out, but he puts me back in Stanley cup finals against New York. I score in game one. I just felt like I was there finally. I got to the finals, and I, and I just relaxed. And I just played some of the best hockey of my life that whole playoff run, except for game seven. I played <laughs> fine. I played fine, but again, I felt that pressure inside me. I felt like, oh, man, I remember being nervous before the game, you know, and, yeah. and not in a place where I could really control my breathing. I could almost feel my breathing was shallow. And you know how if you're not breathing, man, you, you get in trouble out there, and especially in a big moment. But I, I played fine. If I, I haven't had, had a hard time watching that game since, but I'm going to go back one day and just sit down and maybe just me in my house and just, just watch it by myself. But after that season, though, Pitt, I, uh, I took those questions I asked myself, and I started working with a sports psychologist. And I started to kind of – Ask those questions. Was, okay, why did why did that happen? What can I do about it? And that was the first real time that I started to learn how to how to visualize the right way, how to breathe the right way. And then the the really third thing to that would be is I learned who I was as a hockey player, and I knew who I wasn't. And when I I started to get a real clear idea of who I was, I really broke it down into three things. And it was the only three things I really carried with me from really moving forward from that point, which was one, I needed to become unbeatable one-on-one as a defenseman. That's something, if you can do that as an NHL hockey player, as a D-man, you become pretty valuable if you're unbeatable one-on-one. You know, I I dare you to try to try me one-on-one. I dare you to try to dump the puck in my corner. You know, number two was be a great passer. Um, You know, and that's a question you have to ask yourself is how do I become a, a really a good passer. Well, you have to be, anticipate before you get the puck who the who the open man is. And then the third thing was is I always try to if I get opportunities to get shots on net, um, the puck to the to the net. That was what I was going to do. So you start to kind of simplify what you really need to do when you step over those boards. And I think through that year, I get eventually I got traded to Florida after about seven years. I got traded with Pavel Burry to Florida Panthers. That's where you and I had a chance. And I think those were the years. Pitt, yeah, it was great to play with you, but I think it was those years, in, even in Florida, I was still trying to learn this up here, Pitt, and I, I hadn't, I hadn't perfected it or gotten good at it yet. And I, I, you know, those are the moments that you wish you could go back and you could work harder at the mental side. But I think going through some of the struggles in Florida of still trying to learn this up here eventually made me get more committed to it, and that's when I finally got traded to Carolina in 2002 that those years of doing those reps of mental reps and this is another thing your listeners should listen to the fact that when you and i started going into the gym as kids we 
we work out. And if, if the trainer that you took in, took you into the gym pit, put 225 on the squat rack or even on the bench press. And he said, Hey, this is your first day in the, in the weight room. I want you to lift 225 off the bench press. You'd be like, <clears throat> it would come down yeah. and crush your chest. Right. Yeah. Maybe year two, you still wouldn't be able to do 225. Year three, year two, you know, maybe seven year, eight years before you could lift that bar. Um, and la- maybe that way, that's the same way mental reps work. Right. You, you just takes time. You, you're not good at it right away, but you keep working at it. And by the time I hit Carolina in 2002, I had, you know, six, seven years of mental reps of trying to get better at it, knowing I had a lot of failures in there in that window. And, and that was another run with 2002. I ended up getting on this team where, uh, you know, Paul Maurice, our head coach, really brought me into his office and said, uh, Hetty, you know, I, you know, first of all, the night before I was a minus three pit, the night before I got <laughs> traded, I was a minus three. And at the end of the game, I remember sitting in the locker room and th- saying to myself, gosh, man, I, I had a hell of a game tonight. And here I am a minus three, got nothing to yeah. show for it. And you've had those nights, Pitt, right? Where you've had a good night, you've had a good game, but oh, yeah. at the end of the, you got nothing to show for it, but a dash three leading the masters and, and you know, under par. Yeah. And, uh, when Paul, when, when uh, he took me in, Paul Maurice took me into his office and said, you know, Hetty, so happy to have you. We, I love the way you play defense. He goes, uh, you know, I watched your game last night. And uh, I go, oh, man, <laughs> right away. I was like, oh, oh boy. <laughs> he goes, man, I, I thought you had one heck of a game. I know you're a minus three, but the way you played last night, if you play that way here, you know, that's all I need you. I don't need offense from you. Just play that solid defense, move the puck the way you do, get up in the play. And, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun together. And that was like, you know, a coach can do some really monumental things to a player when they just give them that little bit of confidence. And I think that was where the mental reps, a coach believing in me to this moment where then I just started to kind of find who I was as an NHL hockey player. And you can think I joined the, the, the NHL in 1992. Here I am in 2002, 10 years it took me to find who I really was uh, as an athlete and 2002. And I felt it that first week inside that locker room pit. I felt that this team was a team that could, it reminded me of my 94 finals team in Vancouver. I mean, it had all the characteristics of, of, of a group and sure enough, we go all the way to the Stanley cup finals and uh, lose to Detroit Red Wings. Um, but their payroll was over a hundred million. Ours was about 25 and we yeah, were, were a bunch of junkyard dogs. And um, that's why I, I knew I wanted to stay there. I knew Rod Brindamore. I knew the core that we had. And I was an unrestricted free agent for the first time in 2002, where I could have went, you know, a couple other places. And I stayed in Carolina, took less and signed a six year contract because I knew that this was the team that could do it. And, uh, Four years later, I'm in that moment uh, again uh, in the Stanley Cup Finals. So you got two, a second gut punch. It was kind of cool. You know, when you got moved over to to Vancouver, you go to the Cup. You got, now you're to Carolina, you go to the Cup. You probably were a little disappointed in Florida. But that first, that one year in Florida that Mm -hmm. Trevor Kidd got hurt, Yep. I thought that year before he got hurt, uh, that was the team that I thought had uh, the mojo going. But then he got hurt there at the All Star break, and everything just kind of unraveled. Remember I agree. That? I do. I, that team was that had all the the qualities of a team that could have made a great run. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we had great leadership. You and and Mel and just our our veteran guys were good quality men, right? And I think that that was something that you need to have in a good run. And we had we had balanced we had balanced throughout our lineup. We had a real sound defense core. That was a team that could have made a good run had we had, like you say, the goaltending that could have got us there. Yeah, I, it was just uh, I remember going to movies how close we were, and we'd do, be doing rock, scissors, paper to see who had to pay to get in the movie. Then there, you know, it'd be like 20 million on payroll going rock, scissors, paper to see who had to pay for the popcorn. <laughs> uh, there was, and then, he, you know, that happened and the, that dynamic kind of changed and we never got back to it. So I just want to touch on the, the, you get close twice, you lose. 
in the finals, and you get to this third run, um, that final game, you know, was it surreal? I mean, did you guys all just look around saying, this is our freaking night, and it's going to, we're, we're going for it. This is going to be ours. Totally. Um, that year, Pitt was so special. Um, and I, I've told the story before is that Ray Whitney, we played together in Florida. Um, you, you know, he was part of that mm-hmm. core of guys that we played with. And he, uh, he called me the year before in, in 2004, 2005, that lockout season going before the 2006 run. And he said, you know, Jim Rutherford called me and, uh, he's, he wants to sign me. He goes, what do you think of your team? I said, you know what? Um, I know you probably won't believe this, but I think we're a player two away from winning the Stanley cup. He goes, what are you talking about? You, uh, you guys didn't even make the playoffs last year. I said, I know. <laughs> I said, I think this is a team that could really go on a, an unbelievable run. And, and sure enough, you know, this, this team from the very drop of the puck, we did some team building pit. And this is one of the things I'll never forget as well. It, we, we did this ropes course and after the ropes course, they brought us all in and we all kind of got thrown in the middle of that fire uh, among the round circle. We all kind of have got embarrassed by uh, ourselves. Everybody kind of put their themselves out there and kind of got vulnerable. And we all realized that we're all just a bunch of men trying to do our best. And I think that was the beginning of laying down the foundation of what happened throughout the course of that season, where we just seemed to get closer. Nobody put their ego first. And it was all about, you know, making the guy beside you better. Yeah. I, I remember practices that year, Pit that were practices I had never seen at this level ever in the NHL. I mean, just a pace up and down. So getting to your question of game seven, um, knowing that, you know, before that game, I could just, you could just feel how confident, how calm it was in that locker room, knowing we had done the work that every guy in that locker room was important. Every guy felt like they were important to, to the team because every guy knew that the guy beside him was, was, was believing in that other guy. And, you know, I just, I think all the reps that I did mental reps pit and all the things I did leading up to this moment, it comes down to one shift for me, two to one goalie pulled game on the line and six on five against the Edmonton Oilers. And I'm on the left side defense the face-off is to the left of Cam Ward. Rod Brindamore taking, our, taking the face-off. Eric Stahl and Justin Williams, Mr. Game 7, on the ice with me and Mike Commodore. And, and Mike Commodore and I really had a great partnership from about midway through the year. We just got an unbelievable trust together. We always knew what each other was going to do. But we lose the face-off. Roddy loses the draw back to Chris Pronger on the right-hand side. And I think he tries to get it down the wall. It bounces back to Pronger. Now I kind of slide back into this soft spot, kind of covering two guys at the same time. He tries to get it by me off the glass. And I remember this moment, like I can still see it, is the puck is in the air off the glass, and I knock it out of the air. And the biggest moment of my life, and I settle it in that moment, calm the puck down under pressure. I give it to Eric Stahl. Stahl finds Justin Williams cutting between the two defense and he hits him down the middle and down he goes and puts it into the empty net and we ice the, the game for the Stanley Cup final. And, and I think I, I say that because was that an accident of me knocking it out of the air? And I, and, I, and I have to say no, because all of those reps I did on the mental reps, it allowed me to breathe, slow my breathing down. I used to juggle counting down from 100, watching a hockey game while I'm jumping back and forth to do more multitasking for my brain. And when I started doing all these multitasking things, I started knocking pucks out of the air all the time. So this journey of always asking myself, what do I need to improve upon? What are the things I need to get better at that can help my game? I think all culminated into that moment. And, and knocking that puck out of the air and icing the game and getting it to stall to Williams to putting it in empty net and, and coming back to the bench and seeing Glenn Wesley 20 years in the NHL, just tears running down his face saying, hey, Hattie, we did it. We, we did it. And, uh, you know, I think in that locker room, you know, drinking out of Stanley Cup for the first time uh, from Rod Brindamore, it was uh, a great feeling to, to be able to do it with all these guys that you just love so much. 
Yeah, I I was uh, I was there with you, brother, because I was watching at my cabin. Uh, my wife, she because I I once the cup was won, I mean it it kind of faded, but the the first few years I wanted to see that you know once it was over and uh, to see the celebration that in your eyes when you got the cup and you know all the other players, it was pretty special. So. Let's keep it moving along, my friend. Congratulations. i so happy for you. Uh, let's go to the end. You end up uh, getting out, out west with the old Anaheim Ducks. Uh, how did it all come to an end? And then how did the next chapter in broadcasting begin? So, yeah, I, I really retired to Carolina Hurricane. Thought I was retired. And I know Doug Wilson from the San Jose Sharks was he had tried to trade for me a couple of years um, with my last years in Carolina. And he called me in the middle of summer after I had retired from Carolina. He said, Hey, uh, Brett, how you feeling? I said, yeah, I feel great. He goes, I'd love to sign you this summer. And maybe if you'd want to play one more year. So I said, you know what, Doug, I'd love to play for you. So I started training on July 4th, essentially to get ready for that next season. Um, well, Doug made a trade and they had too many defensemen. He couldn't sign me. And now at the end of the summer, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm in shape. And, uh, that's when Anaheim called and I, I, I ended up signing a deal there in, in, in Anaheim, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to play with guys like Nieder, Niedermeyer and uh, Chris Pronger. Eventually we became teammates there. Uh, Timu Solani, Getzlaff, Perry, just an mm -hmm. unbelievable group of men and, and a great, great group of uh, guys was able to, to finally, uh, you know, wind down my career. I think, I think, you know, Pitt and I knew at my end when you just don't, for me, I just didn't have that, I, I call it piss and vinegar, right? Run through your veins anymore. Like you have it one game, but you might not have it the next. And you just can't play in the NHL without having that uh, piss and vinegar running through you. So I think that was where I, um, I, I think I kind of knew that this was my last year. I, I wanted to kind of end it. I got over the thousand games and I just, I was ready to make the turn to the next thing in my life. And broadcasting was that next thing. I never really thought I'd get into broadcasting. I kind of fell into it in San Jose, because that's where my wife lives in Fremont, California. Uh, so moving after I retired into the northern the, the, uh, California area, the Bay Area, um, I started getting asked to do pre and post game for the Sharks. I said, sure, I'll get out of the house. You know how it is when you retire, you got to find some things to do. And uh, that's kind of how it all started. And they started doing a little more in the course of those next three, four years. And eventually start doing some color on the radio and color on TV and doing some inside the glass uh, occasionally. And and now that led to a job with, with the San Jose Sharks where I do, you know, their radio for a couple games in a row and I'll do their TV for a couple games in a row. And that's been a really fun kind of segue going from, you know, a player still being around the game, still being close to the players and still being part of this wonderful game that we, you and I have been a part of our whole lives pretty much. Yes, it, it is. Uh, you going to do it as long as you can? Um, there, there might be a day where I want to do more as far as get back yeah. involved in a team. You know, there's nothing like being around the athletes and being, yeah. you know, having skin in the game. You know, it's like having your chips and they're, they're on the table, man, with all the other players, the management and everybody trying to win a cup together. I think that's to win another Stanley cup is really the only thing I really think about, to be honest with you. It's, it's once you've done it and you want to do it again, because it's uh, such a great feeling. Yes. All right. I got a couple more questions and I'm going to let you go. Um, you, like you said, you played over a thousand games. I mean, I just, I tweaked my groin just thinking about that right now, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and you've had a lot of experiences and had rubbed elbows with a lot of players that had a lot of ex a lot more experience than you did at the time. And then all of a sudden, you're the father figure. Uh, I get in front of a lot of young hockey hopefuls that have very lofty goals. Uh, with the wisdom that you've learned along the way, physically, nutritionally, mentally, what's a little bit of advice you can give these young hockey hopefuls to to keep pushing for that, uh, that big prize. Yeah, I, I, it was, you know, fun talking to all these athletes for hockey day, Minnesota, the last, uh, two days. And I gave them some of these, uh, this advice. I think 
a few of the characteristics I saw from championship teams that were made up of championship people was well, one of the characteristics of people in that championship sort of environment is they have humility. And humility for me means this idea that we don't have all the answers, that we, we look at every day when we show up to the weight room or we show up to the, the practice is that it's a day to get better. And, and really ask yourself at the end of the day, what did I learn today? What are some things that I, I could go into the practice knowing I want to work on? And humility, if you continue to be that, that idea where you don't have all the answers, where you can look at every day as a day to learn, that's something that will really drive you to be a championship type person. I think the, the number two thing that I've always noticed about championship people is championship people don't point the finger. They don't point blame at somebody else. Championship people realize that there's three fingers pointing back at themselves to know that what can they do to make the situation better? What can they do to pick up a teammate to help that teammate be better or, you know, pat them on the back to be able to build their confidence back up? You know, those are the things that are going to give you the tools moving forward to know that it's, it's, you're in an environment to make people around you the best that they can be. Be more interested in trying to help somebody else than yourself, and it'll always come back to you. And I think understanding that pointing the finger that, that three fingers are pointing back at yourself is always going to serve you well when you know that there's more that you can do and bring to the table. I think the other thing is championship type people have character. And character comes from when you say you're going to do something for a teammate or for the team or for a group, you do it. You're, you're counted on and, and you're reliable. Um, and I think if you just keep it simple in those three little things, great things will happen. But I think that one, it's all kind of predicated on this idea of every day is a day to learn. And, and it really takes humility uh, to be able to really do that on a daily basis. I think those are really the qualities that I feel um, were made up of some of these championship teams that I was a part of. Well said. Those are some golden nuggets right there, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Last thing that's uh, besides your wife, Christy, your daughter, Kira, and Emma, who last time I saw you, you were just a retired player and had a girlfriend. Now you're a dad, uh, you know, uh, a career guy. You know, we're, we're both of us, you know, we're different. So this other thing that you're, is, you're pretty passionate about is called headygear.com now hold on a second because i want to i want to know that i understand that it was inspired by something like this yes huh yes with all, <laughs> with all the this was my 1978 1978 blaine bangles oh, hockey I jacket it. it's got the terry cloth in here but there, tell us the story that how uh, headygear.com kind of came into being because it has something to do like a jacket like this, doesn't it? It absolutely does, Pitt. I love that you pulled out your jacket. Uh, we got to get those patches maybe pulled off and we'll we'll get you a backpack, a, a heady pack to be able to put those patches on. But um, I had a jacket full of these patches uh, going through Minnesota in my youth days. And uh, um, my mom, had, when, I, when you grow out of the jacket eventually, you those patches are still there. She ended up taking the patches off of the jacket and putting on a quilt that I still have up at my lake house and up in Brainerd, Minnesota. And so it really kind of inspired, I go fishing with a bunch of these guys and it inspired me to kind of create these backpacks for the guys I fish with. And I ended up putting their names, like a name tape, like a military name tape on their backpack with uh, their school college logo, the number that they might've been in college, American flag, Canadian flag an Ontario patch because we fish up in Ontario. And then if they ever caught a 40 inch musky patch, I put a 40 inch musky patch on their, on their backpack. Um, I created these 50 inch musky patches. So I gave those to my buddy, Greg, that he, where we go to his place, he's the only guy that can hand out the 50 inch musky patch. If you catch him 50 inch musky, you get yeah. the 50 inch musky patch. And so awesome. it, uh, over the years of every year going up there, I would collect patches in the winter. And then when we're up there having dinners, I would always hand out 
patches for these guys. And now these backpacks over the course of, you know, six, seven years really become these stories and these moments that have kind of these moments that make us, that, that remind us of the things and the people that we've become really built off these moments in time. And so, um, yeah, my backpack, uh, my heavy pack has some of these really important moments. I mean, the, the 94 team that you and I talked about where I really learned what a, what a good teammate looks like. Um, yeah. These are my two Stanley Cup ones, uh, my St. Cloud patch, obviously. Um, I spent some time in Hawaii. I love Hawaii. Um, I do uh, – these are two now that I do for Kung Fu. I do some martial arts. And then this is obviously the Sharks Territory patch and uh, some of my heritage of Dublin, Ireland, and my number six. So, you know, these are just some of the great moments. Uh, Brent Burns, he creates a patch. This is Burnsy's Battalion. He gave me one of these. I got this one from a cop in Czech Republic. I traded him one of my patches for his. He took it right off his his uniform and gave me this, uh, the cop in, in, in Prague. Um, this last uh, year oh, wow. when we were up there for the Sharks. And uh, wow. here's my 50-inch musky patch. Yeah, that's the <laughs> one I got for 50-inch, and um, all you need is love. But uh, but that's kind of how it started, uh, Pitt. Um, we just gave 400 uh, backpacks away to all of the athletes that played in Hockey Day Minnesota. They all got their name, their number, American flag, their school logo, and then both of the uh, Hockey Day Minnesota patches for every athlete that played – uh, in Hockey Day, Minnesota. So it, it was really fun to meet all the athletes, to, to, to see them really beam up to know that these heady packs really brighten their day. And now they have a memory like your jacket and like my jacket that kind of re- they can remember these, uh, this moment in time that, uh, that really change us, right? These, these youth years that, that we have a chance to play high school hockey and, you know, playing outdoor ice uh, is really something that they'll never forget. Now they've got something to, to you know, remember it by. Well, what a great, uh, what a great idea. Uh, and I got a little teary eyed right there, my friend. Really? So if you want, you, oh yeah, I'm yeah. going to put that, uh, in the, in the description, because I know that, uh, I got not only myself, but there's several people that, uh, are going to want to learn a little bit more about that. So, uh, awesome. Just, it's just complete awesomeness with you. Uh, Mr. Hedekin, this show has come to an end, my friend. Um, I want to congratulate you on an amazing hockey life. Uh, If there's any of you young hockey hopefuls out there that are looking to find someone you can model yourself after, uh, there's not a better human being on the planet that comes to mind other than this guy, Brett Hedekin. So, Hedy, thanks for being you and making the game of hockey so much better than when you found it continued success my friend and if there's anything i can do for you uh along the way to help with whatever you got going on uh please don't hesitate to ask congratulations my friend lance i uh keep inspiring people you've always inspired me back when we were teammates and uh even back when the 92 run that we had and the the, the, we're just uh young hopeful olympians there it was great to meet you then and throughout the course of my career but keep doing what you're doing pitt love you buddy great to great to talk to you and reconnect Love you too, and uh, I think I'll I'm gonna come and see you. Okay, I, you don't have to come to Minnesota again. I'll come to California. And <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have a glass of wine. I got the sunshine ready for you. It'll be and it's warmer. I'll tell you that much. All right. Well, thanks again for being here. Thanks, Pitt. I didn't lie, did I? What a great hockey story of perseverance, persistence, and determination. Looking for a person to model yourself after, you young ones out there? I couldn't recommend a better person than Mr. Hedekin. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed the Brett Hedekin Hockey Journey. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.